they are some of the world's most notorious serial killers. He was like a god and he had a corpse as his plaything. But were these psychopaths born evil or did their mothers make them into monsters? A mother may actually dote on a child too much. I'm Donald McIntyre, and I'm on a quest to explore how some of history's most horrific murderers were molded by their dysfunctional relationships with their mothers. When it comes to people who are pathological, psychopathic, the influence of the mother is absolutely dominant. I'll be piecing together events in their childhoods and talking to criminologists and psychologists to try to understand what motivated their monstrous crimes. We've never come across a serial killer who'd killed that many people. In this program, Fred and Rosemary West. Between them, the West raped, tortured, murdered, and dismembered 12 women, including two of their own daughters. The combination of the two of them together made the most horrific killing machine this country has ever seen. How did their own twisted relationships with their mothers inform their killing spree? On this very street, Fred West and his second wife, Rosemary, murdered, tortured and raped numerous young women in one of the most shocking cases of serial killing in British history. A specialist search team arrived at Cromwell Street with a warrant to search for Heather West. Officers who found Heather's remains within hours also found signs that she was not alone. Nine victims were initially found here at where 25 Cromwell Street once stood evidence of a sex, rape and murder spree that had gone undetected for over 20 years. In 30 years as a journalist, I have never witnessed anything like it. Um, and I hope for the benefit of people out there that I won't have to, uh, to, uh, to, to witness it again, because it, it's just truly horrific. The remains found in the garden and under the cement that Fred himself had laid revealed evidence of appalling scenes of torture. Seeing something like uh, a masked skull with tubes coming out of the nose to enable breathing brings home the reality of that with which you are dealing. We have no idea the extent of the horror that went on in that cellar. We, we can only guess, but we do know it was often protracted over days, the most horrific circumstances. If you were trussed up, hanging from uh, a beam, then you might very well ask to die. The horrific activities at 25 Promwell Street is now the stuff of urban legend, home to two of Britain's worst serial killers. The question still remains, why did Fred and Rosemary West embark on their path of depravity? Where did it all begin? And what events turned them into the sadistic torturers, killers and rapists that they became? Fred West was born on September 29th, 1941, here in Muchmarkle, Herefordshire, the second of six children to a family of farm labourers. If you think of the West's life as a family, they lived in a tiny cottage. They used to keep a pet pig, which they would slaughter in the kitchen. It was very dirty. It was effectively a hovel. The nature of the landscape, the nature of the day-to-day -day activities was absolutely brutal. It was almost feral. In Fred's case, it meant day-to-day -day, um, contact with death, culling of rabbits, shooting of rats by his mother, which he admired. It was a household in which Fred's mother, Daisy, was very much the dominant force. Very speedily, Daisy, the young Daisy West, before took the age of 20, became the matriarch. She ran the family. She, was, she quickly gained weight from being a slip of the girl. She became a, a rather 
fierce, plump, plain, I always wore a very thick leather belt, which she set about her children with relentlessly. And she would always be the one responsible for punishment, usually with her belt, often with the buckle end. Fred's father, Walter West, was also a violent man who may well have been a murderer himself. Walter West, at the age of 23, marries a spinster of at least 22 years older than he was, who survives for only two years. She dies under very extraordinary circumstances, according to West later, from a bee sting. Oh, really? I wonder, and in fact I'm absolutely convinced in my own mind, that Walter West killed his first wife for the pleasure of it. Walter West enjoyed violent sex and liked to force himself on young women in the fields while Fred watched on. Walter West gave his son a series of, leg of legacies, one of which was clearly about sex. Take whatever it is whenever you want to because there's an opportunity and it's mad not to. Sex was a part of everyday life for Fred, including even bestiality, which his father taught him to enjoy from an early age. Walter wasn't ashamed of admitting to his son that he'd had sex with sheep, or indeed the pet pig at various points in the, in the parlor. And his son thought, well, if my dad does it, why? I don't see why I shouldn't. Walter West's sexual perversity was matched by only that of his wife, Daisy. Her twisted form of maternal love that she gave the young Fred would take him down a dark path. Daisy West, his mother, uh, took him to bed when he was not quite 13, when he just demonstrated the first signs of adolescence, his first erections. And he was later taken into court for sex with his sister, encouraged by his mother. There's no question about that. Now, that is an abnormal relationship. He might have regarded that as nothing unusual in the small house which they grew up in, in the much Markwell area, that it would have had an effect on him and, uh, and what he felt was acceptable behaviour with others. She was the strongest, most physical force in the dysfunctional family. Daisy was the person who said, right, I'm going to initiate my boys into sex. I'm going to encourage my boys to have sex with their sisters. I want my boys to be different from anybody else's. I believe she thought, I want to create my own legend. So how did Fred West's horrific childhood inform his evolution into a mass murderer? Liz, it seems to me that everything about his childhood was perverse but everything about his childhood he thought was normal. Mm, absolutely. And what he's learning in these early days are violent scripts and abusive scripts. They're particular ways of behaving in certain situations. He's learning what he thinks an appropriate response is to any given situation from these incredibly dysfunctional values and, and norms that are displayed within his family. And I, I think if we, we look at his relationship with his mother, yeah, he would have considered that relationship normal. That was one that completely crossed the boundaries, you know, back and forth several times between what we consider to be normal for, for a son and his mother. And it goes against, you know, all of the, the ideas that we have about mothers. They're there to nurture children, they're there to protect them. Uh, mothers, you know, want to prevent their children from engaging in sexual activity for as long as possible. They're certainly not going to be the ones to introduce them to it. But unfortunately, in this case, that's exactly what happened. And it was another 50 years before, actually, psychologists and, and psychiatrists recognised that actually women, you know, were and could be sexual abusers. Mm. Because up until that point, we'd just seen women as the nurturers. We'd seen women as the protectors. They were people you could, you know, entrust children to and they'd care for them. What sets him along the path that he feels he should perpetrate it? Because people who have been suffered victims of child sexual abuse, they, you know, not necessarily go on to perpetrate. So why did he suddenly become a victim and perpetrator? Most children who experience this kind of thing go on to harm themselves, they don't go on to harm other people. But it's when we put it in the context of the, the, the social environment, um, when we look at the other factors, when, when we look at the, the introduction of, of Rosemary later on, it all comes together to create an incredibly toxic mix.
Coming up, who was Rose West and what was her deadly attraction to Fred? Her mother failed partly because of her own mental difficulties to protect Rose from the interests of her husband, Bill Letts, who certainly had sex with Rose from a very early age. Fred and Rosemary West were two of the most sadistic serial killers Britain has ever produced. They were both the product of violent, dysfunctional families, and both were broken by their mothers in different ways. Rosemary Pauline Letts, 12 years Fred's junior, was born on November 29th, 1953 in Northam, a small Devon town in the southwest of England. Her parents, Bill and Daisy, were apparently happy, but behind the facade lay a darker truth. Bill Letts was a paranoid schizophrenic. Prone to violent mood swings, he subjected his family to a reign of terror. William Letts was an absolute monster. If you thought West was bad, you should have known Letts. And what he contrived to do to his daughter Rose was unforgivable. Letts' physical violence and unpredictability drove his young wife into a severe depression. Pregnant with Rose, her fifth child, she was referred to a local psychiatric hospital where she was given a course of electroconvulsive therapy. this day and age, the level of voltage would have been quite high, and it is almost certain that this would have done some damage uh, to, to Rose in vitro. As Rose lay in her mother's womb, Daisy had electric shocks blasted into her brain, the last treatment apparently just days before Rose was born. This was probably why Rose earned the name Dozy Rosie later um, and exhibited kind of rocking behavior, the kind of behaviors that we would associate with neurological damage. This would mean that the more sophisticated elements of brain development, which are much later on in the gestation period, would be the ones that were interrupted. And this would probably include the inhibitory parts of the brain at the front, um, which would mean that she would not quite suffer the same level of revulsion that we have at heinous acts. As his depressed wife withdrew from the marriage, Billette turned to his pubescent daughter to satisfy his sexual needs. Her mother failed partly because of her own mental difficulties to protect Rose from the interests of her husband, Bill Letts, who certainly had sex with Rose from a very early age, almost as soon as she was capable of having any kind of sexual relationship. This strange mother hands off, father hands on very much. Um, the effect on Rose was one of, she would learn that she could get what she wanted by being sexual with people, by enticing them, that she could get what she wanted out of life. As well as the twisted lessons she was learning about sex, the absence of her mother left Rose with unfulfilled emotional needs, which would only be satisfied when she met Fred. Rose is fulfilling the void left by her mother, by her relationship to Frederick West. I don't think you can explain the closeness of the Wests, Fred and Rose, without the absence of Rose's mother. I don't think you can do it quite. If there'd been another different figure, different mother figure, that might never have happened. The lessons that Rose learned from her own mother, who should be there to protect her and look after her, are essentially that you do what men tell you to do, your body is not your own, it is your man's body, and you will comply. And those are very damaging, dangerous messages for any parent to give to a child. But unfortunately, that's what Rose walked away from her parents with. How did this toxic combination of brain damage, maternal neglect and incest shape the young Rose West? So her father is using her as a replacement wife. She's using his daughter for sex. You know, Daisy's kind of out of the picture, depressed, and now she, he's turned his affections, controlling affections, onto Rosemary. 
He has. He's very much singled her out and targeted her as, as the special one. So she would have seen that as some kind of reward, some kind of positive thing. And the interesting thing also about this is that it was incredibly hidden. So whilst Fred West's family were quite open, you know, with each other about you know, what was going on, this was, was much more kind of closed off. What impact do you think did the ECT had on her in the womb? Rosemary's mother had electroconvulsive therapy um, for, for her depression and that must have had some kind of impact, the degree of impact, we're not too sure, but we do know that, that Rosemary did display some rather disturbing behaviours as, as a young baby, so she would rock around in her cot, she would bang her own head, so that there was something that had happened in those very, very early days which had had an impact on her behaviour, but how important that would be in years to come. It's very difficult to say. There was certainly a hint of impairment or brain damage, as we would call it. Yeah, and when we look at the, the brains of, of people who go on to, to commit murder, um, there is a suggestion that they, they look slightly different to, to people who don't engage in, in violent acts. So the, the part of the brain that we often talk about here is the prefrontal cortex. So this is the part of the brain that, that controls the emotions, essentially, uh, the difference between right and wrong. It, it helps us suppress urges that, that we might have. And in people who, who've committed murder, uh, the, these areas of the brain tend to be less active. So it, it could be suggested that this electroconvulsive therapy did have an impact upon Rose's brain as she was developing as a fetus. 150 miles away in Muchmarkle, Fred West had also experienced an abusive childhood at the hands of his mother Daisy and father Walter. Age 17, he too was to suffer brain damage as the result of a motorcycle accident. Following Fred's motorcycle crash, the brakes were taken off. Uh, his, his behavior entirely. Um, the morality was removed. This was absolutely noticeable by other people. He quite simply could look at something which is garish and horrific and feel absolutely nothing. There are some people who suggest that West's injury and what they assert was a metal plate placed in his head accounted for his later behavior as a sexual predator and a serial killer. I've never believed it. I'm not even sure that he actually had a metal plate in his head. I believe he would have become a predator and a killer, regardless of the accident. West was already known to the police as a petty criminal. Now age 20, he was prosecuted for incest. He had impregnated his 13-year-old sister. But as always, his mother rushed to the defense of her blue-eyed boy. There is no doubt in my mind that his mother Daisy's attitude to he could do what he liked, take what he want, made Fred feel invincible, that he was effectively free to do whatever he chose, whenever he chose to do it. If Fred went to, had a bad time at school, for example, misbehavior, Daisy would march down to the local primary school and berate the teacher for, no, you can't treat my son like that, that's Fred, he's a very, you know, perfect, boy and she was still doing that when fred was charged and then went to trial on the incest daisy turned up to give evidence in his on his behalf saying my son would never dream of doing such a thing even though of course she knew perfectly well that she'd been encouraging him in mitigation west relied upon the side effects of the motorcycle accident as part of his defense but in the event his sister refused to testify against him and he walked free from court so how much of a role did brain damage play in turning Fred West into a psychopath? We've talked a lot about kind of, you know, environment and uh, learned behaviours, but there are genuine physical injuries, incidents which happened to Fred, which may explain part of his behaviour. Well, when Fred was 17, he was involved in a, a motorcycle accident where he, he had a, a significant head injury. It was reported by his family, though, that after the accident, after he'd, he'd recovered, he would fly into to sudden fits of rage that there was a, an essential change in his personality and we, we've seen this in, in other cases as well so it's not something that we can discount we can definitely see this as potentially part of the puzzle that that made Fred West. So if we're looking at albeit with her impairment 
You had Rosemary being chosen as the golden child by the dysfunctional and controlling father, William. And then you had Fred, of course, being controlled, being, being appointed the chosen child by his own mother. So we can see these parallels and see how both these kind of people kind of were going along the same trajectory and, when, and how perhaps when they would meet, terrible things would happen. Yeah, and when you compare their mothers, in, in, in Fred's mother, you've got somebody who is very actively abusing him. If you look at Rosemary's mother, she's also, you know, complicit in the abuse, but through being passive. There's also lessons learned from her mother, from her mother Daisy, was that this is how you please men is through sex, mm. and that is an answer to a lot of the problems. And so at a very early age, she was very sexualized. Yes, and it, it started incredibly early on. So if you think of normal psychosexual development, you know, this was you know, completely abnormal. Um, so she, she's having sex with her, her father. She's being abused by her father. And, and this is something that, that she's taking to be normal, but as we know, is completely abnormal. It seems to me both mothers were central to their creation of these murderers. One was passive and one was very proactive and took away Fred's virginity, but both sent out the same message. That is, your sex is a weapon, it's a means to control people. Coming up, we explore the murderous motivations that sent Fred and Rosemary on the dark path of destruction. When they came together, they, the two were a greater together than they were separately. They were more powerful, more predatory, more sexual. Serial sex killers Fred and Rosemary West were practically programmed by their mothers to embark on their murderous careers. The dysfunctional relationship the pair had with their own parents while they were growing up would have deadly consequences. It's 1968. Rose, now 15 years old, has moved out of the family home to live with her father, Bill, continuing their incestuous affair. Fred, now 26, is married to prostitute Rena Costello and has a string of women on the side. He has already committed at least one murder using the skills he'd learned working in an abattoir to dismember and bury the bodies. Fred had started killing before he met Rose, murdered uh, his girlfriend, Annie McFall. Fred's first murder really was, a, was a, a murder of convenience. So he had broken the taboo. Part of what made Fred so deadly was that on the surface, there was nothing threatening about him. Fred was very likeable. He was also quite a charmer with the, the ladies. Uh, he had what I would refer to as some um, gypsy good looks, uh, and he certainly had the gift of the gab. He was that little sing-song voice. He just had that little twinkly face and that... I'm, I am describing a monster here, but to look at him, you wouldn't have thought he was a monster. You would have thought, what an intriguing little man. Rather funny, but nevertheless... Oh, I don't you know. Utterly unthreatening. Fred would trawl these country roads looking for women to charm and entice into his van. Few escaped unharmed and several ended up dead. It was also on his travels where he would meet Rosemary Letts waiting at a bus stop. We believe that Fred and Rose met at a bus stop where Fred stopped to give her a lift probably as a predator, wondering what he'd get out of Rose. Um, there was a kind of instant attraction. He saw her, in many ways, as the perfect woman. She was sexy and sexualized. But also there'd be elements in Rose that would reflect Fred's relationship with his mother. Uh, Rose would also be a strong and strident person who would kind of get close to Fred, who would kind of try to control him and f provide him with a challenge. And Fred did seek that. The sexual abuse that Rose suffered from her father and the sexual initiation that Fred got from his mother meant that they were both highly sexualized from a very young age. When they came together as partners, it was absolutely certain in my mind that that became what's known as folie ardeur, that they, the two were a greater together than they were separately. They were more powerful, more predatory, more sexual. 
Initially, Billette violently objected to Fred, even reporting him to the police for having sex with Rose, his underage daughter. But he soon realized that Fred was a man in his own image, and the two men even went into business together. Once Fred and Rose were together, Bill Letts was a regular visitor, not simply to have sex with her, which he continued to do, but also because Fred saw in Bill Letts someone who could be his, how can I put it politely, his assistant, a partner in crime, a co-conspirator. And so it became this menage a trois. He would have got some power, some, some feelings of reward, out of making Fred share his wife with him, and that would have been a very big motivation for Rosie's father. Possibly the only reason he would consider having Fred as a son-in-law was that he still had a share of his daughter, and that's an incredibly disturbed way to look at human relationships. In 1970, Fred was jailed for theft, leaving Rose, now 17, in charge of his two children. For the first time, the couple would now conspire to murder. Rose is a young woman, but she's looking after Charmaine, Fred's first child, almost eight, and Anna Marie, a baby, in the flat in Midland Road. Fred is in jail, and I think they decided that Charmaine was too much of a handful. And it was agreed that Charmaine should be killed and indeed buried beneath the coal hole in Midland Road. There is little or no doubt in my mind that Charmaine represented the, the genesis of the killing spree, that it was the spark that ignited the later killings. Charmaine was a link to Fred's past with another woman, and we know that Rose was capable of great jealousy, and she didn't want the past infecting their life, impinging on what her and Fred wanted to do. So the murder of Charmaine would be a very convenient way of rounding off and cauterizing the past and separating that from what they were then going to go on and do. By murdering Charmaine, the couple had crossed a threshold from which there would be no return. Now, there are many sexual predators who abuse and rape, but who don't kill. What turned these two into killers? Well, I think it was a complete lack of any boundaries, any behavioural boundaries, any, any sense of, of morals, any sense of what's, what's right or, or wrong. And there was, there was no check on, on their behaviour. So I think the interesting question is really not why did they do it, but what was there to stop them? In many ways, not only were they both themselves groomed to be sexual victims, but they end up grooming each other. They do. They, they go from a situation where, where they are both victims, you know, to, to an extent in, in the early days, um, to a situation where, where they both come together. These were two people who, over many years, had been exposed to violence and had perpetrated violence. So for them, murder is just the, the next stage on, on their, their violent journey. It's not something that would have particularly been shocking or disturbing for them in the same way that it would be for, for anyone else. In January 1972, with Fred now out of prison, the couple were married at Gloucester Registry Office. They moved into a larger house, 25 Cromwell Street, where Fred continued to groom his young wife into the woman of his dreams. Fred effectively pimped Rose to a number of people locally. He would often offer a neighbour, would you like to, you know, make love to Rose? perfectly all right, you know, might be 20 quid. Their lodgers were also invited to have sex with Rose while Fred watched on, peering through holes he drilled into the wall to indulge his voyeuristic fantasies. Sex and sexuality and nudity was everywhere in the West House. People would walk around naked, there would be pornographic videos and men constantly going to the bedroom to have sex with Rose. Her sexuality was brought to bloom, blossomed under Fred's tutelage, but it had already been established by her relationship with her father and also by the lack, really, of a relationship with her mother. Increasingly, the West fantasised about rape and torture. 
Fred soundproofed the Cromwell Street cellar and converted it into a fully blown bondage chamber, equipped with vibrators, duct tape, and a variety of metal instruments. The couple now went on the hunt for vulnerable young women. Fred and Rose would pick up victims by driving along and basically kind of coming up against people. They looked for victims who would be in the category of what we might call less than dead, kind of prostitutes, people on the run, um, the homeless, people who would not be noticed for a great deal of time if they went missing. And girls would get into the car because there was a a woman sitting in the, in the passenger seat and um, what appeared to be a comforting figure. Nothing sinister seemed to be there to put them off getting in the car. Basically, the combination of the two of them together with the affirmative backgrounds they had, that it was OK to rape, it was OK to harm others. Um, this made the two of them the most horrific killing machine this country has ever seen. Over the next decade, eight young women were abducted, imprisoned in the cellar, and subjected to unimaginably hideous forms of torture. Both Fred and Rose derived an enormous sense of power from the action of abduction, rape, and killing. It gave them complete control, which is what they sought. Then it became a matter of, let's have fun with them. Let's have fun with the victims. Let's make them play things. This is a couple who would go into not just killing victims, but torturing them. What actually went on in that cellar we are not absolutely certain of, but we do know that we're talking about torture protracted over many, many days, um, people dying under the most horrific circumstances. To begin with, Fred was the dominant partner, but how did this murderous dynamic between the couple now evolve? It was nearly a competitiveness of my readings, you know, where one would push one to the other. Will you have sex with this person? And she would kind of nearly be dared to say no. She didn't say no, and it elevated to the next level. And then, uh, then and on it went, this kind of terrible trajectory towards murder and torture and rape. We often like to, to look at these, these killer couples and say that the, the man was, was leading the woman, but I think it was very much a level playing field with these two. And neither one is, is the victim or the perpetrator in their relationship. They're, they're grooming each other. They're, they're becoming the, the ultimate killing machine. It's clear that he put her through several different initiation processes, a kind of tests how far would you go, and eventually she proved she could go as far, if not even further, than he would. Yeah, exactly. It is very interesting how the, the power dynamic between these two, you know, changes and almost kind of flips um, from, from their, their, their meeting in the beginning to, to their final murders. So uh, in many ways, she started out being an apprentice to his deviant, but very soon, they became equals. And then, in latter stages, extraordinarily, she kind of took the lead role. She became one who could claim the master. The West didn't confine their attentions to just vulnerable young women. Their eight children were also sexually abused from an early age. It was a family ritual in which Rose played at least an equal part from the outset. Frederick West's continual habit throughout his life, starting with his own children, but then going on to the women and girls he abducted, was, quotes to break in my daughters. Anna Marie West suffered dreadfully at Fred's hands and still to this day carries the scars, was broken in by Fred and Rose in the same way. In other words, we made have sex at about the age of 10 um, with her father. It was, that was, the norm, that was the dysfunctional reality for the West, and one which West never forgot. And Rose, his wife, immediately joined. By 1987, the West's eldest daughter, Heather, was resisting their advances and starting to rebel. Most people would think simply the idea of not only killing, but then dismembering 
your 16-year-old daughter and then burying her in the garden of your house in Cromwell Street and then making a family joke of it, all of which happened, would be inconceivable. But to Fred, it was simply a practical matter. There was a danger, he thought, I'm convinced, that Heather was going to go to the police and tell her then what had been happening in the house. He thought, I've got no alternative here, I'll just kill her. And then, of course, I've got to conceal the body, so we'll conceal the body the way I've concealed the other bodies. In other words, I'll bury her in the, under the house. So you put her under the patio. Fred then buried his own daughter, and the younger children were threatened with the same fate if they ever said a word. Once again, the West had got away with it. But five years later, a chance encounter would be their undoing. By complete coincidence, some of the younger West children are playing in Cromwell Street. And a bobby, believe it or not, actually on a bicycle, stops. And they're asking him, and they ask him, uh, what would you do if uh, one of your brothers or one of your sisters had been, you know, abused by your father? which ignites an interest in the possibility that the Wests may have been abusing their children. During the police interviews, the children say, well, well, we know where Heather is. She's two down and three across in the garden patio. And the police go, well, and the, ch the children think it's perfectly normal. What do you mean? Because they're often told, Fred used to say to them at mealtimes, you don't watch out, you're going to end up like Heather, two down and three across. And, that was how the whole world that they, this extraordinary world they created, began to unravel. Coming up, the first time the world glimpsed the unspeakable horrors of the Cromwell Street cellar. If you were trussed up, hanging from uh, a beam, you were having knuckles um, hacked off, then you might very well ask to die. In February 1994, the police recovered a thigh bone from under the rear patio of 25 Cromwell Street. After a killing spree that had gone undetected for two decades, the Wests would finally face justice. After the arrest of the couple on suspicion of the murder of their daughter, Heather, Fred was keen to take the blame in an effort to protect his wife, Rose. The police had no idea that any other victims were involved. Fred wasn't remotely uh, concerned with regards to the uh, issue of the um, arrest. Um, in fact, my recollection is that he phased me somewhat because having given him the time-honoured lawyer's advice of um, It'll be all right, don't worry about it. Um, just wait till I get there. His response was something along the lines of, oh, well, I've told him I've done it already. This afternoon, Mr. West was charged with two more, both women, both so far unnamed by the police. As more bodies were discovered in the garden, Fred now confessed not only to Heather's murder, but to 11 more killings going back to the 1960s. West was charming his two police interrogators with the kind of grooming skills that he'd obviously used on his victims. And then when he changes and finally starts to admit the crimes, he does it in the most sing-song, happy little voice. Oh, well, I'm afraid I just, oh, I, just, I think I used the ice axe. No, I, maybe I didn't. Maybe I used a saw. But I, you see, I had to get her arms and legs off so I could get her into the dustbin, and then I had to cut her head off. It's the bizarre aspects that he seeks to convince us all is normal, um, which is the most chilling. So, for example, uh, he said, um, mind you, he said, um, I did um, close her eyes. Well, it wouldn't be right, would it? You couldn't have your daughter looking at you, could you, while you were doing it? By taking full responsibility for the murders, Fred hoped to protect Rose. But her response wasn't quite what he was expecting. There was a very telling moment uh, in court. It was the first time that they were both in court together. He thought that she was going to fling her arms around him 
and snog him uh, to show her affection. In fact, uh, she moved um, away from him on the bench, looked away from him, no communication whatsoever. Uh, and I think that came uh, as something of a uh, shock uh, to Fred. The evil spell that had bound the couple together for over a quarter of a century was now broken. On January 1st, 1995, Fred West was found hanged in a cell at Winston Green Prison. Stephen said he believed that his father deliberately chose New Year's Day as the day to kill himself because he loved publicity. He'd scrawled Freddy the mass murderer from Gloucester on the wall and left a suicide note addressed to Rose. He signs off with, on a suicide note, all my love forever and ever to Rose. Now, was this suicide an act of kind of um, love or was it an act of control? I think the timing of it is particularly interesting. So there was um, a court appearance where Rose didn't basically meet his eye. She turned away from him. And I think that for him was a real moment, a real moment of rejection. And, and it's one that I don't think that he could cope with. More than anything, I think it was his final act of, uh, of power and control. And I think he's at the point now where he's realising that, that all of the female figures in his life, which he, he's used as you know, anchors, essentially, for, for this abnormal kind of reality that, that he's, he's had around him, they've all gone now. So his mother was out of the picture. Rose is now out of the picture. He's now in prison. He's going to be in prison for the rest of his life with, with very few women around him that, that he's able to influence. So, so I think it is the end of, of Fred West now. When he scrawls Freddy the mass murderer on his prison wall, that's an act of defiance. He's leaving a mark there, isn't he? Saying, yeah, this is who I am. This is where I'm from. Remember me. So he is he's more than aware of of his status as a, a murderer as a celebrity who is relishing in his moment in the spotlight i mean that's how psychopathic can you get absolutely and he is is the ultimate anti-hero isn't he in his eyes i've done these terrible things but but look i've done lots of these terrible things so notice me and, and know that i'm here as the trial began, Rose maintained her innocence, claiming she too was one of Fred's victims. Her stepdaughter, Anne-Marie, would be a key witness for the prosecution, telling the jury how Rose had raped her with a vibrator when she was just eight years old. Within a few hours of the, of the trial starting, it was a shocked court. It was a shocked court. There is a poignant moment in Rose's trial in which the image of Charmaine is shown to the jury. This tiny skull, this young, young person, and it was almost impossible to bear. How could they possibly kill this utterly innocent eight-year-old? She was a deeply wicked woman, and she wasn't being submissive. I do not buy anyone who's watched Rose, anybody who saw her trial, cannot for one second convince me that that was a submissive woman who simply did whatever Fred told her and didn't know what was happening in the house. After countless police interviews and extensive excavations at the Cromwell Street address and at two other sites where bodies were buried, justice was finally served on the lone survivor. Rose West was convicted on 10 counts of murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of release. 300 miles from Winchester, Rosemary West arrives at the prison which will be home for a lifetime. Durham, where she was held on remand, is one of only two high security prisons with the facilities to house her. The Wests were two of the most horrific serial killers ever. But were their mothers ultimately responsible for their sickening crimes? This was a unique couple. These were unique circumstances, but undoubtedly they would not have committed the crimes they did unless their mothers and their family environment had been as abusive and destructive as they were. No, I think that was a really, really important part of, of the puzzle of, of Fred and Rosemary West was this incredibly dysfunctional, abusive childhood in which violence was, was normal and it was allowed to escalate without any consequences. So I think the questions that we need to be asking now is, 
are the children out there experiencing similar situations to those that the Fred and Rosemary West did? And if so, what's being done about it? You know, can we look into the future and say that the likelihood of this happening again is pretty rare? You'd like to be able to say, yeah, this is rare. But when we're looking at, at these specific families, so Rose was abused by her father, um, Fred was abused by his mother and his father. So you've got this cycle of abuse. And unfortunately, it's come out in subsequent generations. So Fred's son, Stephen, has been convicted of, of sexual offences. So it's very difficult to break this kind of cycle. Rose West has now served more than 20 years in prison and will remain there until she dies. She has yet to show a scintilla of remorse for her wicked crimes.